Welcome everybody. I'm glad to see you here. Um, we are going to talk about uh, doing IoT development using Python. Um, first, let um, let me introduce myself. I'm Matthias Schmidt. I'm in the industry for quite some time, starting off as a C and assembler, code monkey, um, doing a lot of device drivers and stuff, um, low level programming. Um, um, I was with Sun Microsystems for some 12 years, and um, I'm interested in programming languages and and and, and compilers and, and stuff like that, low low level stuff beyond any reasons. Um, I'm with um, the company Diva A since some five years. Okay, uh, now I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Thomas, and uh, I'm a rather young developer. I've started development in 2007 uh, with uh, the LAMP stack. And since then, I've moved on over to C Sharp and Java and others, as well as Python, of course. In fact, it was one of the first things I learned when I started my career in 2013 in the sysop, uh, you know, industry. And, um, yeah, and with the way since 2015. And now I want to go into, uh, what's covered and what isn't by this talk. Um, we really don't want to talk about Python all too much, really, uh, but everything that surrounds it. So we won't talk about, uh, you know, the code we used, but we really want to talk about uh, the architecture we chose, why we chose Python 3 in an embedded um, situation, how that worked out, and uh, a little bit uh, about the project. Okay. Here we go. So um, first and foremost, I, I want to give you some sort of an overview about the system we're talking about, the whole system, um, which is a, a, a gateway, which you, you see here um, uh, in, in the middle of it, a gateway um, passing events, um, uh, passing, passing uh, sensor events between uh, a, um, a, a radio network into uh, Java-based um, uh, backend systems called the cloud. Yeah, because of the, uh, uh, the, the headless nature of this, this gateway, uh, um, we had to use uh, mobile software for Android and iOS to kind of kick off things and, and, um, uh, uh, do the initial setup and do the reconfiguration and, um, also passing on, um, alarms from the sensor network, uh, to the mobile phones. So this is the overall picture of the system passing, um, passing events back and forth between a uh, proprietary uh, network and sensor um, uh, stuff uh, into uh, the cloud software and back again. And um, now let's talk about the gateway itself. We will stick with the gateway since uh, th this is the IoT part of it. Okay. Um, we are, um, um, we're dealing with some sort of a, um, a Raspberry Pi kind of similar uh, device here, ARM v7. Uh, um, Linux-based system, so not a traditional microcontroller, no, no, no Arduino or something like that, or Atmel or something. Um, but it's, it's, uh, in terms of programming, it's a, it's a full-fledged Linux, um, with a lot of communication facilities on board, with, um, many things going on in parallel, um, um, uh, Custom hardware, which is the receiver you can see here, um, real time clocks, communication, uh, LAN, uh, Bluetooth uh, chips and stuff like that. On top of it, um, uh, Debian Linux. Um, for communication purposes, we, um, um, we went the Dbus way and, um, the application itself, uh, uh is written in, in Python 3, uh, running in process, uh, Python 3. Uh, this is the, the app portion here. So this is the the uh, embedded embedded system we uh, we used as a gateway. And um, now let's um, take a look at the um, the architecture we, we we've chosen. It's a kind of a, a traditional one, a traditional star-like uh, architecture for the software, um, where we have more than four modules here uh, trying to um, do something. Um, 
um, uh, trying to do some uh, only one thing and do this right. So we have a, a module for for accessing the button or for accessing LEDs, for accessing the the, the radio network, accessing uh, the the, uh, the the internet, and um, this. Um, Star-like uh, architecture for this um, uh, for this device um, brought a lot of benefits. Um, one one is that you can plug out one individual module, supply it with some sort of a testing context here, and test it individually. So we can. Uh, uh, code down our uh, uh, network decoders, protocol decoders, and 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 security stuff, and and test each individual on its own, um, which yeah worked out quite well. And um, this is yeah um, shown here by by mock. You can mock pretty much every module, and um, you're you're good to go. And on the other hand, uh, since we are um, Highly uh, dependent on hardware and ha special ha uh, special hardware devices like a, um, a, a, a push button LED similar uh, uh, stuff. We um, also exchange for running everything in the CI environments. We exchange certain modules um, uh, because they rely on hardware. To give you an example, in the CI um, environment, the uh, LED module um, simply don't. Does any any GPIO programming, but uh, uh, prints out. I I switched on the, the the green LED to give you an example. So so we 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 uh, could run pretty much all of the code in um, in the CI uh, environment. Next, actually, before uh, I introduce you on why we chose Python three, I want to tell you which values Matthias and I shared during development which should uh, help you to understand why we did things the way we did them. We really believe in don't repeat yourself, dry. Um, it's a really good pattern, uh, no duplication if possible. Um, we really believe in the right tool for the job, so we won't just jump on a new tool because it's new and cool. And um, small is beautiful, really. So we are talking about a device that's in service for around 10 years, and we want to be able... Um, that someone else um, can maintain the product, and for this you really need to um, you need you need to cut down on on the things you do, and you don't have to go into abstraction heaven. And then we coined something which we call the Feng Shui software development, um, which pretty much just means that um, if you are on the correct abstraction layer, at least that's what we believe. And you have all those puzzle pieces flying about. They will just you you'll you'll know where they that where they go. It will just feel right, and it will be an indicator that something's wrong when it doesn't feel right anymore. Okay, so now over to why we chose Python three exactly. So first of all, let's look at what was a given thing for us when we started development on the device. Um, we knew that we have an ARM v7 running Debian Linux. Um, we knew that we we were relatively low powered. And now, don't get me wrong. I think if someone uh, here in the audience is into embedded, he will he will internally shout at me, "You have got so many resources and just don't know it." And yeah, you're right. But we're talking about a Raspberry Pi uh, A class device. Um, we're really not doing much. We're just a collector and an emitter. We collect stuff from the radio network and we send it out to the internet. So we're relatively dumb for a smart device. Um, there's lots of parallel things going on. So for example, you can talk to the device via BLE. You can, uh, you know, um, use the, uh, or you can see the LEDs in which state it is and stuff like that. And, uh, one of the things we also knew, um, that we had to do, there is this receiver part, which talks to the radio network, and it's fully proprietary, even to us. So we just had a C library, and they said, okay, uh, this is a C library, go with that. And with that, we knew that we had to choose something uh, that understands C, or that can interface with C rather well. So what, what, what are the options? The options are C and C++, of course. Um, I think that's a given when you're in embedded you, you, it's one of the uh, most common options. Then Go was an option for us. We wanted uh, to, to seek out for new languages, safer languages. Uh, Matthias is a big fan of Go, and I always wanted to learn it, so it was an option too. Rust is something we both liked. 
or I still like, but uh, back then it was still not ready for Prime. Uh, so we really didn't, didn't use it. And then uh, when we looked around, we stumbled upon Python. We both knew it. And, uh, well, it has a very long-term support through the Debian community. They uh, don't mind patching it five-plus years. Um, it is quickly to write and easy to read, even for people who are new to Python and who have previous programming experience in other languages. Um, what's really good about Python is that its batteries included. Uh, so you can keep your uh, external dependencies way down because most things are already in the standard library. And of course, there's a simple way to interface with C um, through the use of CFFI, and you don't have to do manual memory management, which is a huge plus for me as well. And another thing, we didn't really need um, a high-performance application because... As I said, uh, we we just are collector and emitter. Uh, this doesn't have to go in the um, microsecond sort of range. If it takes a second to transmit an event, that's okay with us. It worked out rather well. Let's now talk about one of the central components we've used, um, and it's called DBus, which stands for Desktop Bus. It's an asynchronous message bus, uh, which is normally used for desktop apps in the GNOME environment. So if you want to see what uh, what Dbus does on a GNOME system, just boot one up, kill all Dbus, and then you'll see a black screen. Um, that's pretty much how important that is. The communication with Dbus is standardized. There are various implementations of the standard, um, but we just use the standard one, the uh, reference implementation, so to say. It started in 2002 and was stable in 2006. And here you can see in the picture um, that we had blues which we used for Bluetooth, and we had Network Manager, which we used for networking, and our app connected to the bus, and they talked to each other, and it was uh, rather nice. Now, I promised you some problems in the uh, description for this talk, so I'll give you some. Um, there were really no problems uh, with Dbus itself. So Dbus just worked fine at a very low footprint. To my amazement, it is even fast. Um, um, yeah, uh, and... It had standard Python bindings, but they are really not well suited for using nowadays. Uh, they are known to be broken uh, beyond repair even. And um, yeah, they're deprecated. They tell you don't use them, but we did as everyone else seems to do on the internet. Um, and it was uh, not the best idea we had. So the lessons we've learned from that was um, switch to something that works, like PyDBus, which is based on GDBus, so the GNOME implementation of DBus. And I think you can uh, trust them a bit on this because they use it uh, so heavily themselves. Applications that use something like DBus really need to uh, be designed around uh, it because uh, what will happen is that you need to run a main loop, which they provide, and it will devour your entire application. And you will only run uh, when the main loop idles, which is also a plus because events then become first-class citizens uh, in your system. Um, there is a Dbus monitor you can use to monitor the Dbus and monitor messages, um, uh, check out timings. Maybe get uh, used to working with uh, these tools before uh, you have a problem. Makes things easier, I can tell you. And... One other thing we really learned is that GDB is a really cool tool for debugging Python and native parts, especially when they're working together, because you can just view them uh, and you can browse uh, through dumps that you've created. It's rather nice. So check it out if you haven't. And also do this maybe before you've got the problems. Might help. <laughs> okay. Uh, now I, I like to talk a little bit about Plus, Plus I don't know how to spelled correctly um, um, this is the uh, the standard way of uh, of doing bluetooth and bluetooth low energy communication uh, in linux so it's some sort of of a given it's uh it's around since nearly 20 years or so um, it's made up of some some kernel facilities uh, some kernel modules and uh, a userland daemon um, uh, doing the um, communication to the the hardware devices um you can either use it uh, in, an, in a synchronous fashion doing uh, a, a linkage against the, the C library, and it has as well uh, a supported uh, a Dbus uh, plug, so you, you, you basically 
most of the people use it uh, in, in a deeper asynchronous fashion. So, um, and we um, had to use Bluetooth since we, are, we had to come up with a, a mobile software uh, doing uh, initial setup and, and, and reconfiguration of, of the device. Um, and um, it, uh, it turned out to be quite a rough ride. Um, Bluetooth itself, basic Bluetooth, is stable uh, even in, under Linux since since many many years. So connecting your 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 wireless um, um, keyboard or your your wireless mouse works works quite good. But um, with Bluetooth low energy, we we really did some sort of the the, the bleeding edge here. And uh, uh, our experience was um, if you um, if you go with uh, um, um, the speeding edge technology, um, as probably always, go with the latest version of uh, uh, of your your tool chain, of your libraries, of your your your, your plus stack. So uh, things got better in the long run, but uh, when we started off, um, it was quite a mess. We had core dumps, we had hangups, we had uh, this and that, pretty much everything. Um, but um, on the other hand, I I, I was really I was really amazed about uh, 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 the help we've we've got from from the community here. Um, another thing uh, uh, we we were facing we, we have been quite quite naive in the, in the first place. Um, the um, um, uh, Bluetooth low energy is not always Bluetooth low energy. So so connecting uh, uh, um, thousands different Android devices to your Bluetooth low energy. Um, turned out to be uh, quite tricky, and uh, um, uh, on the Android side, we had to introduce many ifs and then, and and doing special handling of certain devices. So, uh, in, especially on Android, um, you you have a lot of uh, uh, testing here. Um, but as I said, uh, things got better. Now I would consider um, um, uh, consider the, um, the, the, the blue stack, uh, and the Bluetooth low energy part of it as a stable thing. But we learned the hard way. Um, if, if, uh, the maintainers, uh, uh, take something as experimental, they are not kidding. <laughs> um, so, um, but on the other hand, as I said before, um, uh, people have been really tremendously helpful on, on the mailing list, the car, car committers fixed, uh, um, Many stuff nearly instantly, and uh, uh, we could um, circumvent a lot of stuff in in the um, the Android uh, and iOS uh, mobile devices here. So, um, but be prepared if you do Bluetooth low energy with uh, with Linux. Um, really um, take into account you you have to do a lot of testing, manual testing most of the time, uh, since uh, um, all Android devices behave differently when, when it comes to Bluetooth. This is because um, different chipsets, different versions of Androids, different microcode loaded into the chipsets and this and that, um, you cannot imagine. <laughs> um, so um, you cannot rely on something like a spec. I programmed against the spec and, and this ought to be, this, 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 this got to work. No, it, it, it doesn't. So let's now talk to the other participant on the bus, which is Network Manager, a rather unconventional technology to be used with an em embedded device. Now, I have a question for you all. Who is using a Linux-based OS on their notebook? Who of you is using, well, most of the room for the video, um, who is uh, using Wi-Fi on their notebooks? Also most of the room. And who is using Network Manager on their, on their um, laptops? Uh, a, a, a couple of, of people, at least. Um, now, the thing is that Network Manager is regarded as this desktop solution and this laptop solution, and you cannot use it headless or something like that. Uh, it's actually not true. It consumes very little resources. Um, it abstracts all your network configuration into uh, so-called connections, and it will then just cater uh, to whatever device is best fit to fulfill this connection. So it makes things really easy. There's a dbus and a there's a dbus connection and a C library. Um, it can emit status change events whenever something changes on the network, which makes uh, working uh, with uh, the network quite easy. Because uh, I think um, you might think to yourselves now, 
well, you can just do if config, uh, the interface, and then add an IP address, and that's about it. And I can tell you, no, that's pretty much not about it. Um, you really have to monitor the device. You have to peek and poke proc, is what I called it. Uh, you have to uh, do so many things, and they are so hard to get right. Um, and we, we've tried to, really, because we wanted to keep the dependencies down. Uh, but it wasn't really worth it. It's network manager and others really support all the things. So what were the problems? Well, we didn't really have problems with the network manager. Now, I, I'm not going to say that network manager doesn't have any problems, but we weren't facing any. Uh, but what we did face were strange Wi-Fi hardware issues. Now, to the guys who use uh, Linux on their notebook, have you ever had issues with Wi-Fi? A couple of heads nodding. Um, and I can tell you that most of the time it's either something in between the network manager and the device or it's uh, just the driver itself or even the kernel. Really not uh, not so much fun of uh, handling those errors uh, and there's o uh, only so much you can do. So that's pretty much it. And the lessons learned were really don't roll your own network management code. There are people who have done this for decades and they do it a lot better than you can do it, uh, off the cuff at least. Um, Network Manager is small enough to run uh, in a headless situation and stuff like that. And brittle drivers can, of course, ruin your day when you really just try to get things done. Let's now switch gears and talk about a general issue. This slide is called RTFM, which, as you know, is the politest way a programmer can ask you to read the documentation before you spam the IRC channel. Um, and here I've pulled up the timer objects documentation. As you can see, it's quite simple. It's just define a method, then uh, uh, you, you start it, and presto, right? Um, well, most of the times that's actually true. But uh, we have faced something uh, rather unfortunate. Um, now, we already mentioned that we connect using Bluetooth Low Energy and we don't want to keep the connection open all the time. So what's the easiest solution to uh, get rid of the connection? Well, you just set a timer 10 minutes from now and, uh, yeah, um, close the connection. Um, so far, so good. This worked out quite well until one day when another developer on the team gave me a log file and said, yeah, Bluetooth turned on mixed configuration. And I was like, what? Um, I turned off, yeah, I turned off MITS configuration, um, and I was like, what? How can this happen? He sent me the logs, everything looked normal, and then he showed it to me. And yes, MITS configuration, so when we weren't really done, but when we had connected to the internet, um, we were turning off Bluetooth. Well, turns out that, uh, well, we have an NTP running, and in the first version of the prototype board, our RTC was faulty. So we pretty much jumped days ahead, which reset the timers because they are not monotonic in Python, at least on Linux. Um, so yeah, so it, the timers just did latch and they did what they were supposed to do, just not what we expected of them. Um, the root cause for this really is uh, a missing parameter as far as I've understood this uh, um, for glibc and the kernel. Bug has been open since 2012, by the way, and not so much work has gone into it. Um, and now uh, you might ask yourselves, okay, so now that we know it's broken and what's broken, what can we do? Well, first of all, you can buy a working RTC. That's one solution and uh, a certainly good one. Um, you can also try to, uh, to roll your own kernel, roll your old glibc, roll your own Python 3, which may be fun, but uh, in a time critical situation, it's probably not the thing you want to do. So what else, uh, what else do we, uh, can we do to do the, uh, to mitigate this? We can do a workaround in Python, actually. So what we've done is we've made a, uh, a sliced timer, so to say. So if you, if you had a timer for 10 minutes, you can imagine it like so. Uh, then you just had slices one minute each. And if, the time jumped ahead, you would only lose a minute at max, which could be unfortunate if you're in the last minute, but um, wouldn't be so bad if you're in uh, the other 
uh, other um, parts of the minutes. Uh, it's a, it's pretty much a dirty hack. So don't tell anyone that you've did this. Um, but uh, it works fine. The lessons we've learned here uh, is that documentation is one thing and can be beautifully written, but uh, really you need to look down into the implementation to see what's really going on. And even if you're not trying to do C or try to circumvent it some way, you need to be looking, uh, you need to be able to look into these things so you can find out what's actually wrong. And it's crucial to a project like this to be able to be doing this. Yeah. Another thing uh, we've been um, experienced, um, but something you might be aware of already is this. Um, although we both really love Python and, and, and love working in, 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 in the REPL and everything about uh, Python, um, this, this uh, highly dynamic nature of Python comes with some sort of a cost. Um, and, and here's, here's an example which really happened uh, in, in the field in our project. Um, we introduced, um, um, we changed the, the signature of a method. We introduced a parameter in between, which is not a wise idea anyway, but, uh, nevertheless, we, we had to introduce this, um, this parameter here. And one of the, um, uh, the callers, we simply forgot to update the caller. So, and this is what happened if you don't go with uh, type ins uh, or stuff like that. Um, as you can see, if you call it uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the traditional way, uh, Python rolls out uh, um, 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 the table or the list, whatever, into your, your, your um, private key variable here. And no front end compiler, nothing, no runtime will stop you from doing this. So you're ending up and having some sort of a string or, or whatever as your RSE private key. Um, have, I really have fun uh, doing the, 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 the um, uh, debugging online here and, and, and trying to figure this out. This is, this happens so easily. And this is, I call it this, um, the, the cost of uh, doing dynamic languages, but um, um, yeah, luckily there, there there's, there's something you can do about it. Simply use type hints. Uh, I cannot stress this point more. Um, do um, even for for the for the simplest uh, um, methods, uh, uh, guard yourself against these kind, kind kinds of uh, 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 problems by uh, uh, doing doing type hints in the first place, and you can uh, you you should uh, check this uh, using your, your your CI systems. So you some sort of combine um, the, the quick and easy style of, of doing Python coding with um, checks and balances on 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 the backends and, and the CI systems. Um, just as an example, um, what we um, 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 uh, dis discovered on the way, and this this was the the only downside when when we uh, uh, in our decision to use Python for 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 this in, in embedded device. But um, uh, honestly, a, a downside you can uh, work around. Okay, so um, to wrap things up um, after this project, what what are the 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 the, the, the big takeaways here? What uh, uh, what our our lessons learned? Um, really try to do um, um, CI and testing from day one. I mean, we are all lazy and we say, okay, I'll I'll, I'll do the testing, and I'll do the CI integration next week and next week and next week, and at the end of the day, um, 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 you, you you're running out of time. You never do it. Do yourself the favor and do it on the very first day. Spend spend some time upfront to um, um, to get your tooling right, to get your, um, uh, your, your, your whole tool chain up and running and, and, and get yourself acquainted with those kinds of things. Even if it's, um, it, it, it turns out to be a hard fight against some managers and trying to educate them that this is really necessary. This really pays off. This pays off in the long run and, um, 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 you're, 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 you're good to go. So, um, can you do test first? Sure, you can. I'm not, not not religious about testing here, but uh, especially if you go, uh, if you uh, run with a, a high, highly dynamic programming language like um, like Python, um, you um, you should uh, equip yourself with lots of tests. When it uh, in, in in our case, uh, um, protocol decoders, uh, cryptography stuff. Uh, um, so we we did test first, not for all modules, but many of them. 
So, uh, and, and this also really pays off. Um, code coverage. I introduce, um, code coverage tools. And, and, um, uh, again here, don't, don't, don't be religious about it. Don't shoot for having 100% code card coverage. In our exam, uh, in, in, in our case, for example, uh, doing code coverage on a module which uh, turns on LEDs or so, um, is, is completely pointless. Yeah. But when it comes to your own, uh, coding, your own, uh, kind of algorithmic uh, stuff, uh, try to, to, to keep up a good code coverage and, 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 and cover everything with, with tests. I know I might be um, uh, uh, um, stress this a bit too too much, but it it really pays off. Um, tie pins, linting, uh, uh, all those tools. Set them up uh, uh, up front uh, in in your CI system and and um, and really um, um, equip yourself. Um, and the last thing which really paid off uh, was. Um, uh, try to uh, to to have all the the the, the different phases uh, in your in your your build in your build uh, uh, run uh, uh, make 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 it in, enable to 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 um, call them up individually. So we um, used a, a traditional make file, and uh, we uh, we have been able to kick in uh, in, in 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 various places. Um, this also makes your CI integration quite easy. If people complain uh, and saying, okay, I have a lot of trouble, I cannot put this into a CI system, it, usually this is just an indicator that uh, uh, your, your build system is, is too complex or, uh, or too many individual steps are, uh, or too, too, too many manual steps are involved. So if you prepare yourself with a good uh, make file or, or whatever I call it, whatever tool you want, want, want to use here, uh, and if you... Um, Separate individual steps and phases, and and uh, you can can start them individually. It's it's a, a no brainer to plug in uh, uh, the the C C CI system of your choice. So um, these are probably kind of boring or <laughs> uh, not not hacker like recommendations, but they 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 pay off. I also have uh, a couple of things for the wrap up. Um, as we said uh, um, in the beginning, and Matthias told you just now, uh, tooling is important. It needs to work, and broken tooling is a big no-no. Uh, trust me, if a project gets into a bit of uh, a, a stressy situation, you know, time pressure and everything, you'll just let you, you'll just let it slide. You'll do what uh, what you shouldn't do, and uh, in the end, this just makes you less productive. And makes it less likely to get things done in a um, timely manner. Uh, then, what we also learned, and what I really ap appreciated about this uh, project, uh, try to figure out what is the most important thing about what you're doing here, and what are the most important concepts of your design. For us, um, this was communication and security. And putting them at the core of everything we did made it a fun to work with the system because things just fell where they needed to fall. And, um, also it, it made talking about things really easy because you really didn't need to think about it. When someone asked you about security, you just knew what the system was and what you guarded against. And it, it made also some questions just evaporate in, in thin air. Uh, because they were already answered by our software. Um, you can try to introduce security late in your code, uh, but let me put it this way, it won't be a smooth ride. And then the last point, which was very important for me, is that really we're engineers, and there's a bit more to engineering uh, than there is to programming. And in the end, what we do here, it's just software, it's just technology, uh, and given the time you will most likely figure out even the weirdest issue or you'll find a way to circumvent it. But what you, what you will not find is a way to regain trust if you, if you lost it to your customer, if you lost it to your teammates. So in the opening today, it was mentioned that we need to be a nice community. And this is not also true for uh, open source, which was very nice to us but also um, very true in the workplace and for your teammates. So always keep this in mind. It's mentioned way too less, in my opinion. 
Lastly, we do have a quote here that really um, basically illustrates this. That's about it. Now, are there any questions? Single step it in in in. Um, uh, the, the question was uh, how debugging in, in my day to day works. Um, the the answer is single step it in 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 GDP. Try to get uh, uh, debug symbols for your Python and for all the C modules you have, and 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 bite the bullet. But to be honest, this is nothing I do on a day to day basis. Since if you prepare yourself uh, upfront with um, a testing and that, uh, you you normally don't end up in 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 GDP each and every day. But uh, if it comes down to really nasty uh, um, um, yeah bugs, you you mind doing that way, and then you can use any front end to GDP you you want to use, or you do like like me the the traditional command line version. Um, the setup was actually always, uh, I, I don't know, um, were you talking about the manual testing? Yeah. Okay, so I think the question was um, that uh, um, if we ever thought to automate the manual testing, right? Um, yes, we did. And our, um, and, and well, in, 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 in our setup, we actually accounted for all of these things so that we can really do this. But in the end, we never got around to it because the test setup, getting this all working, um, is a bit complex. So in the end, we just skimped on that and just did the manual testing in a coordinated fa uh, fashion using TestRail. Um, when it comes to testing, in, in, in other uh, um, areas, we, we, we could, uh, uh, or, or we really did some, some automatic testing uh, with external devices. Uh, we had, um, for the, the sensor network and this proprietary radio protocol, we had emitters which we could program in, in, in Python as well. And so we can, we, we create some sort of a feedback loop, issuing some sort of radio commands and catching them in our software and, and see whether the software uh, reacts as it, as it should. So, um, to my belief, really try to do as much as possible uh, uh, in, in an automatic fashion. But if you have a, a, a matrix of, in, in our case, more than 30 or 40 Android devices, um, um, you really have to do it on, on your own. Okay. Um, I have a question regarding the Python product you mentioned. Okay. Um, the type fixing solves the problem in your case there, but it sort of only solves it coincidentally, right? Because if the two parameters happen to have the same type, then you don't have to catch it that way. Well, right. <laughs> Why don't you use uh, human only arguments if you're, you're on Python 3? Yes, you're right. Hmm? So for the video, the question was, why didn't we use keyword-based arguments instead of uh, the type hints? Because they would only solve it coincidentally, because if we had the same types, it wouldn't help anything. Um, yeah, the answer was, um, yeah, it would have been a solution. We used it uh, in a couple of places, but not everywhere. Um, and in my experience, um, getting quirks with keyword arguments can also be uh, quite troublesome. And at least you'll get an error when you miss out on a parameter for uh, the if you just list them out. But um, there were some some places where you don't get an error if you use keyword arguments. Yes. 
Um, yes, the, the question was whether we use a mocking uh, for, for several devices. Yes, for example, um, we have a hardware button attached to the, to the device which turns on uh, or off uh, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy. And uh, the mocked version is basically an identical module which is not connected to the actual hardware, but uh, which you can um, issue an, an, a, a unique signal against. And a, a certain signal means uh, pushing the button or pushing it long or s something like that. And these were the, the 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 kind of tricks we we used to to um, do mocking. So it's not this sort of mocking in a traditional way where you're facing a big uh, a frame and you try to get things done and and you have to mock all, all the, the the kind of logical um, um, entities of your, your your code. We did more of a Mocking away our hardware to be, uh, to, to keep on running on CI systems and, 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 uh, to, to, to simulate certain behavior. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's a good question. The question was, uh, why didn't we look into, or if we looked into um, spawning an access point instead of doing Bluetooth Low Energy um, for configuring the device? And the answer to this is clearly yes. But um, we did this a little bit late in the project. We were really only, f uh, you know, uh, trying to circumvent the BLE problems we were facing. And, um, well... It then turned out that, uh, we could just circumvent the BLE problem. So we, so we went with that. But, um, yeah, it was definitely one of the things, uh, we had in mind. And it would have been the thing that we would have done if BLE wouldn't have come together that nicely that it now does. Two questions. Okay. Coverage, the standard coverage to high coverage. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's good enough. I mean, there, there's probably some more fancy stuff around, but, uh, um, coverage did fine for us. Last question. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys.